What is, what is it that has, has made Avery, I know we, t I feel like we talk about Avery every week lately, but like, what is it in his vision that's kind of put him in the position of being, how he's been as a return? I'll say, you know, Avery's been doing the same stuff that he's been doing since last season. You know, when he got here as a rookie, he does a great job of having an urgency to the football, understanding the game plan, Mike, of which way the ball's being punted and correlating that with the returns that we're running or the rushes that we're running. And then I think another part of that, too, that's been big is the players that we've uh, you know, added on the field with with uh, Avery. You talk about a guy, you know, the, the most athletic players on the field when it comes to punt return and the, when you talk about punt coverage. All right. Usually those returners are dynamic. They can make people miss in space. So when you talk about the team's punt team, the most athletic, dynamic guys on the punt team are the gunners. And they don't have, in the punt game, those gunners, they don't have to protect. They could just release when the ball snapped. So being able to slow those gunners down is a critical part to that. So when you talk about guys like Mike Ford, you know, who's been – been in the league for going on five seasons. He's played that position. You watch the punt return from the other day, he, he single-handedly takes out a gunner by himself. And he does that week in and week out. And those plays, a lot of times, go unnoticed because he's on the outside and he's, getting, he's taking on the, their best gunner and trying to do a great job out there, along with D. Alford, along with you know Armstrong, those guys. And then you talk about the interior, those guys blocking or rushing the punt. So all those correlate to Avery's success. And you talk to Avery, and I'm pretty sure he says, you know, he can't – there's other 10 guys on the field blocking for him, which helps. And it allows him to go do his job and get vertical with the football. If, if he – because Arthur had said that it came close to him playing corner mm -hmm. the last two weeks. If he ends up in that situation, do you almost have to pull him off a punt return just because of – you know, at least for the rest of that game because of the other duties involved? No. Or, okay. The most important play is that play. He's our starting returner, so whether he's playing on offense, playing on defense, because he plays on offense, right? He, he has a critical role in offense, and if there was a situation where he had to play on defense, just like last year, he's still going to be our returner. He's still going to cover kicks for us. So we're, when that situation happens, obviously Coach Smith and myself, we have those conversations, but Avery is our starting returner. So it's important that he, we try to get the ball in his hands in the return game and gain first downs and make sure that our offense has the ball in the, the next play. I realize this, I'm probably walking right into the hypothetical junction here, but, Can't uh, wait. but if whenever Cordero comes back, does he return to being the kick returner, or does that have to be maybe a difficult conversation at this point? I mean, he's one of the best returners in NFL history. Yeah. So whenever, he dis whenever he's ready to come back, that's going to be a great problem to have. And we're excited, you know, we're excited once he gets healthy and he gets back going. Um, it's just another weapon for us in the return game. So we're excited. Um, right now, obviously, we have, this week we have Carolina. Uh, but when we get CP back, it's going to be a, a great opportunity for our team to have a dynamic returner back on our team. What are the skill sets, physical and mental, that you look for in that gunner blocker position? The jammer position, as we call him, a jammer. Um, look for a guy that's fearless, that has speed, that's aggressive. Um, we talk about the term mean but clean. We want to be mean, we want to be aggressive. We got to slow the gunner's motor down because those guys are the first ones to the fight. And they got to be fast, aggressive, like I was saying. They got to be able to play in space. And they have to play with great effort. And then also, too, understand the rules of the game. We want to be aggressive, but we want to do it within the rules. We don't want to hold. We don't want to block in the back. And we have to understand, have good spatial awareness where our returner is at, just so we don't get pushed into the returner, um, making sure that we could, you know, certain things, certain responsibilities that we have when it comes to playing that jammer position. And again, Mike Ford, he does a great job, along with our other corners, of playing that position and helping our returner out, give vertical with the football. Is there a guy that you use historically or you know, recent history or back whenever that, that's like a teach tape for that position when you're talking to guys about it? Who's done it really, really well? I always kind of try to use our, our current players or you know recently former players. When I got here, Mike Ford was one of the guys that I used. For example, when I coached, I coached him in Detroit. I, he's one of the reasons, and I know I'm talking about him right now, but he's one of the reasons I'm in this position right, right now because of the former players that I've coached in my last couple of years, whether I was in with the Chargers or with the Lions. And our players, they do a great job, whether it's current or former players, bringing the calls to life. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that position, you know, for those players. I wouldn't be a coach if it wasn't for players. That's why we get to coach the game. And guys like Mike Ford, um, coach guys like Justin Coleman before, Jason Verrett, Brandon Flowers, those are guys that I use as an example. And you could say Jason Verrett and Brandon Flowers, 
powers, both starting corners, Pro Bowl corners in the NFL, it took a lot of pride in playing that position when it comes to that, playing that jammer position. You talk a lot about, about getting the offense a first down. Well, the numbers say that you're getting two first downs now. And there have been, it wasn't just the big long one the other day. You guys have been pretty consistent in that area. Mm -hmm. Is there some confidence and pride being built in that steady execution? And do, do your guys maybe think or in meeting rooms that, hey, we're pretty close to breaking one? For sure. We're, that's the first play on offense. So our number one objective is to put points on the board. We want to make sure we get the ball, but we're trying to put points on the board. We have possession of football. We're trying to, you know, score points. So our guys do feel confident. But at the same time, we have a lot of room for improvement when it comes to that position, Scott. When it comes to, you know, winning at the line of scrimmage, winning downfield. Yeah, we could have, like, let's say we have a 15-yard return. But we had the opportunity to get 25 or 30 yards on that return, being in better position, winning with leverage there's a lot of basic fundamentals that we're currently and we're every day still trying to work on and our team and those guys that are on there have that combination of 11 players out there we're still evolving and trying to get better each and every day and we only get better with reps we're never when we go into a football game we're guaranteed zero punt return reps so we never know. It could be a fourth and one it could be a fourth and ten they could punt the ball backed up they could punt the ball from the 50. Our guys just have to stay prepared before the opportunity present, presents itself rather than being unprepared without the opportunity. And the only way we could do that is by honing in on our basic fundamentals and our technique. Uh, what are some of the, uh, the alerts for uh, punter Johnny Hecker and how's he doing for the Panthers this year? Well, Johnny Hecker, strong leg punter, very athletic. Um, he has directional ability. He could punt the ball. He could truly flip the field when you're talking about punting and flipping the field. He's, he's been a pro bowler, all pro player, uh, highly respected at this level. So we have a great challenge this week going against Johnny Hecker. And then also, too, you talk about their gunner, um, Franklin. He does a great job on, their, on the outside, number 42, one of their top tacklers on their team. He's been, that's how he's made a name for himself in the league as a special teams player. So it's a great challenge for us, uh, for us, and then you could talk about uh, Sean uh, Chandler, the PP number 34, the safety. He does a great job. They use him as like a third gunner in their coverage units. He's a quarterback of their punt team. So the combination of Hecker, you know, you talk about Franklin and Chandler. It's a great challenge for us when they're doing flipping the field and, and controlling field position. Where, when you when you kind of look at where the offense is right now, like at kind of a the midway-ish point, mm -hmm. I guess. Like, how do you assess what you feel like y'all have done well versus what has not? Yeah, I think when you you get to a certain part of the season, right? Obviously, even from a roster standpoint, right? It can change what personnel you have out there due to injury or whatever. Um, and I think you have to take it. I've been caught up in the mid-year buys where all of a sudden, like, you reassess everything and you go back. The reality is each game has its own entity, right? So you, you look at how each game was played and what was needed in that game. Obviously, uh, offensively speaking, right, there's certain games in which we obviously we did well in terms of drives and scores. Other games, we hit lulls. And then you kind of reexamine throughout each game of why. Right. Instead of looking at this total picture and saying this and saying that, you know, obviously there's a lot of variables involved. And for us, no different than how you approach this week. Right. So you're playing a different scheme defense than you played the week before. Um, obviously different personnel. So for us, right, when you reevaluate and you look at things, you always say, OK, do we put our players in the best position um, coach wise? And then for the player standpoint, do they rely back on their fundamentals or do we do things uncharacteristically, physically and mentally? And so I think moving forward, right, you're always reassessing design, preparation, fundamentals, right, for us. And I think that'll always hold true regardless if we're at the midpoint or we're towards the end of the year as we kind of go. Yeah, Coach, what are some of the um, variables uh, in general uh, with regards to developing young quarterbacks? And then I'm going to follow up, of course, will be to this. Yeah. It's almost a stumper there question there, d -led. I think from this standpoint, right? So each quarterback that comes in the league is different, mm -hmm. right? Regardless of how many years they played in college or what scheme they came from. So when you take those variables of experience, scheme, then you get to your scheme. Um, I think those are always, there's going to be a curve, mm -hmm. right? So when you get to that curve, then it's about how many reps that player obviously gets a chance to have. And that's why I think you saw us in training camp uh, and off season go with a two quarterback for the most part with obviously Felipe um, taking his part. 
to try to gain and garner as many reps as possible. Um, when it comes to young quarterbacks, uh, right now, if you look at the ones who are not playing, you get all that in scout team, right? You have to, you ha even though you're not running your plays per se, a lot of the plays are similar in the NFL, and you have to take each play as if it's yours so you can gain that experience. There's nothing that will ever replace the do of the act of doing. Right, so when it comes to the quarterback spot, every time that your backup, if he's young, gets a chance to go out there and throw it around, like he's gonna, he's gonna garner and gain experience. Now, you have to go play games. There's no doubt about it, and I think that obviously becomes the next step. But until that happens, it's about how well can you prepare off the field. That, I think that's one of the more harder challenges for young quarterbacks coming in, rookies, first-year players, is the fact that it's not just your ability to throw the football. The reality is there's a lot of guys that are not in the NFL that can throw a football, and they're not in the NFL for whatever reason. You obviously need to, cr you need to cross over a bar in terms of physical ability to be at this level. But then what is really the separation point? The separation point for me right, is going to be your ability to retain and then obviously the functionality of the mental part of the game. How well do you know the plan, even though you're not practicing it necessarily? Right? Do you know the calls inside and out? Can you vision the play when you break the huddle? So I think getting those guys, the young quarterbacks, to realize this is a full-time job. It's not 20 hours a week like it is in college. There's no other distractions. Like This is all part of it. Um, I think that is the next step for any young quarterback coming in. Some grasp it sooner than others. Um, others do better just by doing than, than the classroom. But it, it, there, it's rare to find one guy who can't do both. Right, who's just a classroom guy and can't play or just on the field and can't do the classroom. You look at the guys who have longevity in this league, there's a reason why. It goes hand in hand from the preparation, mental and physical. Boy, that was a long answer. I'm not sure what you got of that, d -Lad. I just kept going on that. I'm not sure either, but yeah, it sounded right. good. Perfect. Did you, I mean, that was also a role you were in very early in your career. Right. How much do you impart that to Desmond? Yeah, it's more about your own experience. Yeah, it's more about what well, really is what I didn't do. Um, the, the mental part of it I took for granted because I went out there and ran scout team and I just said, okay, I'm not going to play this week, right? I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to throw it around. I'm going to get better physically. I'm going to get better fundamentally. And then what happened my rookie year is I was forced to play. And so it was one of those situations where um, when I became a coach, especially at this level, I was going to press upon any backup quarterback, regardless of age, the importance of preparation because that failed me. So you always learn through your, either your experiences, your environment, and I felt that I failed in that regard, and I obviously learned from my mistakes, um, where you have the ability to prepare yourself, even though you're not getting those reps. Like, take every single session in the classroom, walk through whatever, and it's the act of actually going out and like playing the game in your mind. I just went out there and said, all right, I got, a, I got an individual, I got some team periods, I got some seven on seven, and I'm out of here. And I think that was a 22-year-old not really understanding or grasping the idea of what it means to be a professional, right? And so every quarterback I've come across, it's been, you can ask them, that's been a pretty hard lesson for me to pass on because I have to relive it, but hopefully they can learn from it. What, how long did it take you to realize that you messed it up? Yeah, until my, my career was be told I was done. I mean, I didn't obviously have a long, long career. As I look back, you always reflect on your experiences of what you had in life, regardless of what career you pick. And you wonder why things didn't work out the way you do, so you reevaluate. And that was definitely part of it. It wasn't the lack of, I would say, want or intelligence. It was like the lack of the, the discipline of putting myself through the fact that I had to talk myself into a, well, I guess I'm not going to play, so I shouldn't. Well, that's the wrong approach, right? And you hear a lot of quarterbacks now talk about who now go in the game for whatever reason at a certain point and said, hey, I prepared like the start of that week. And that is the right mentality. I think it's a lot easier said than done. How's Desmond doing in that regard? Well, again, right, regardless if it's Desmond or any quarterback that I've been a part of, like, that is part of the preparation. It's part of the mental grind. I think that's the one thing, you know, when you look at any young player who comes in this league, regardless of position, think about this for a second, right? So they come out of their college season, they go to a draft combine prep, regardless of where they go. That's months of their life. Then, right, they get drafted to a city they probably are not familiar with. They move there, OTAs, then you got a little bit of a break, then you're right into training camp, and you're right into an NFL season, right? So a lot of things being thrown at that young player, regardless of position. The biggest thing that we can press upon the young players is to understand what that grind really looks like, right? When you get into the season, you know, there's a bye week, no doubt. But the reality is your season's not over past Thanksgiving. 
right? We still have a long way to go. And so it's un making those guys understand that how to approach each week and how really to have, and we talk about this in the quarterback room at the time, the capacity for boredom, right? You've got to be able to do the mundane things over and over and over. Even though you think you've got it, you got to do it again. And that's part of the grind that comes with any player, not specific to a quarterback, but you can include a quarterback there. A couple weeks back, uh, Arthur was, 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 was talking about Dez, and he was saying that he was very uh, uh, mature in his mindset, that that was something that you guys saw during the pre-draft process. Have you kind of seen that as well in terms of his approach to the classroom and those types of things, even though... Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll obviously, you know, Coach spoke for himself there, and I'll speak for myself when it comes to Des. I think, you know, what you look for from a young quarterback is the ability to, to retain and understand information. Um, but again, I will say this, when it comes, regardless if he's a rookie or not, um, Des has a dual mandate. The mandate is to make himself, prepare himself as if he can play, which get himself ready physically and mentally. But then the other mandate is to make sure he is the best he can be for that, for that starter, which is Marcus. And so what he has to do is know that plan inside and out, like any quarterback who is a backup in this league, right? That starter should be able to come to you, ask you questions, maybe a film question or a plan question, and right, you should be an extension of the coaching staff, no different than the starter. But that's why I think being in that backup role, it, you know, it's, a, it's not for everyone. You know, when you look around the league, I know like just for my personal example, you go from being a starting quarterback in college and then you're getting every rep and you're the guy and you're, you're leading the team the way you want. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go from getting no reps or a few reps and it's not your team necessarily, but you have to be able to transition, right, to, to gain value and to bring value. And so how do you do that? You prepare yourself as if you're going to be the guy, you're a play away, but then you're also there for the starter, knowing that you guys are working together to get the best out of the quarterback room. Four-year starter at Cincinnati. Like, is that harder to do when you've been the guy for that long? Well, I think you know that'd be obviously a better question for him to answer. I'm just talking in general, right? You have to be able to come in and understand your role. It doesn't mean you're not competing or you're satisfied or anything like that, but you understand what is needed for the team that week. And if, regardless if you're the backup quarterback or you're the backup tight end or back. That's non-consequential. What matters is the fact that you can go out there. If, you're, if your number's called, be ready, be prepared. If it's not, you're absolutely adding value to the guy that's playing in front of you. And to me, that's what a great teammate is. Regardless of the position you're talking about, that's what brings great culture and obviously gives you a chance on Sunday for everybody to come together and specifically on offense to have a chance to win. Hey, Coach, what challenges does the Panthers defense uh, present you on this Sunday? Yeah, good question. You're the D-led. Yeah, yeah I got gotcha. you. I mean, we're a little bit into this, right? Yeah. Um, look, right, I know I'm a, I'm a broken record up here at times, but my goodness, and you put the film on, and um, there's not many holes in this defense, right? They have really good players at all 11 spots, regardless of their base or sub. They understand the scheme. And I always say this up here. You can always watch defenses – and when you put the film on, especially early in the week, and you really watch them play, and the faster they play and the more they take away from the offense, the greater grasp they have of what they're asked to do. And that's a dangerous combination for an offense because they can play fast, they can take things away, they make it hard for you, they make you gain everything. Um, they're a very good tackling team. They play really good with their leverages. They can rush the passer. They can play coverage. So again, you know, obviously we know what the score was um, when we played them last year. Right, there's some different characters there, obviously, this year. Um, where they're trending defensively, that's pretty good. You know, we're, we're going to work cut out for us for sure. What's, if you guys had TVs, you really haven't yet or haven't done it yet. If you had to fully open up the passing game, how, how comfortable would you all be doing yeah, I don't, that? I understand where the question's coming from. I don't see it that way. Um, what I see is, and you guys have heard me say this before, what it takes in that drive or that game to go win the football game on offense, right? We can control our side of the ball. So the reality is, you know, if we find weaknesses or we think this is where our strengths are to do a certain thing, then obviously we're going to try to stay strong where we're strong or attack where we need to attack. If certain things call for certain things, then obviously we have to be able to adapt and evolve during the game. And I think more importantly, that's really what it comes down to. Right? Our ability as a staff and players to understand the big picture as the game's progressing and making sure that we do our best job to continue to attack and try to score. And, uh, you know, how much stock you put in the last two games, given you got new people making, uh, you know, the, um, 
the decisions over there as opposed to the first five games? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you're talking about. You got a new coach, Steve Wilkes, and they oh, look I like they're playing. I thought you were talking about our players. Oh. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know who you were talking about. Whether you're talking about the opposition or if you're talking about new players that we got on our team making decisions. You know, I meant the, the new new approach to Carolina's taken with the third quarterback they've used this year, PJ, and it looked like they're running a lot more. Well, it appears to be. You know, you never know. Um, you just got to be pre pre prepared for a little bit of everything. Um, you know, who knows what he did last week may not be the same he does this week, but it seemed like it was a pretty good formula against Tampa Bay, who's a pretty good football team. So I would think that it would be similar, but again, I, I don't know. We, we just got to worry about us playing us, you know, and playing, doing the things that we do well, playing hard, playing physical, doing the things, executing. It's really a lot of times it's more about us than it is about the other team. Yeah, you got to take care of the other team. You got to take care of the other team's good players. You got to know what they want to do and all their scheme. But it, when it all really comes down to it, it really comes down to how we handle things and how we play. It, to me, it's all about us. When you looked back at, this, at the Bengals game, did you just run into a buzzsaw with a bad situation personnel-wise, or did you feel like you, there were things that you should? didn't do nearly as well as you should have. They're both. Uh, you know, A.J. going down certainly didn't help things. Uh, and But at the same time, we got to do a better job of coaching. I got to do a better job of coaching and not putting guys in harm's way. Uh, we had a tough time matching up against them. It or hurt us. Uh, but then there were some other things, too, that, you know, uh, the very first touchdown, we fall down. <laughs> so, I mean, what are you going to do? Tell the guy, don't fall down? You know, so it's, it, he didn't mean to. It happened. It's, it, it happened. So you just got to learn to adapt to the, you know, got to put those things aside, you know, and just not let them get to you. And sometimes our, our youth shows up in some of those situations sometimes that we let things linger a little too long and bother us. And if it does, it bothers you the next play too, probably. So we just, that, that's going to be experience. You know, you got to be able to handle, you know, adversity. And things are going to happen, especially in the back end. Um, and some of them aren't going to be pretty. But you got to kind of put it in the back of your mind, and that's the part of being a defensive back and being a defensive player is you just got to let it go, and you got to come back. And I thought we let it get to us a little bit and didn't panic, but I'm just saying didn't play quite as aggressive as we had in the past. I think and then then you're playing a little bit on your heels, like I don't want to give up the big play. Generally, that's when it happens. And we just gave up too many explosive plays in that game. Period. I mean, you get 500 yards offense. That's it, it. Wasn't like they ground out 500 yards. They hit big plays, and that's been one of the things we did. Even last year, we did very, very well. Is we didn't give up big plays. And in that game, we did. So, in my first rodeo, and the first time I've gotten my, you know, what handed to me. I mean, we gave an example the other day that uh, we're five and one. I think at, at uh, in 2012 with Baltimore. We get down to Houston and get beat 44 to seven. I mean, we, in 2017 at, at Baltimore, we shut Cincinnati out at home 20 to nothing. Go play Jacksonville, get beat 43-13. There isn't a coach in this league that hadn't had it happen to him. There isn't a team in this league that hadn't had it happen to us. I'm sure Tampa Bay didn't think it was going to happen to them. Just got that's how you bounce back. Now we got to see the maturity of us coming back and just getting right back on the horse and going again. With midseason, I don't want to say it's an open competition, but uh, actual competition at position between practice squad guys, which maybe is happening at corner right now. How do you make that decision on who you're going to elevate or call? How well they practice? Yeah, so it all goes through practice. What else would it go on, Mike? Oh, I, I mean, how, like, would I, how else would I evaluate? Uh, it could be experience. Like Cornell Armstrong has more experience than those guys, or did last week in terms of game experience. I, I didn't know how that. It's how they practice. If he guys experience, then he'll practice better. Fair. Random topic. These standing scrums that we see at the end of carries, usually running backs, where you've got a bunch of offensive linemen pushing a guy, and y'all you, you, are pushing the other way. Is there any particular coaching point from your end other than get the ball out from, from him, I assume? Cut him. Cut him. Yeah. Somebody got, somebody got to get the guy's legs. Yeah. If you keep pushing up above and they're pushing and I'm pushing, it's like a scrum in rugby. Right. Somebody got to cut the guy's legs. Yeah. You know, somebody got to go down there and get the guy down on the ground. The only way he's going to go down on the ground is if you get his legs. 
So it also used to be, back in the day, illegal. You know, now they now you can get behind a quarterback on a quarterback sneak and push him. That didn't used to be the case. That used to be illegal to do that. You couldn't, you could not uh, uh, aid a runner from behind. It just becomes a shoving match. But now, now you can. It's not illegal. It's well, not the illegal. The process behind the rule change. Do you know? I have no idea. You tell me what the thought process is about most rule changes. I'd like to know. Well, <laughs> most of them, probably. I mean, it's... yeah. There have been a whole lot of defensive decisions made over the years. Do you, know, do you ever find yourself feeling for the for whoever the poor guy is stuck in the middle of all that? No. You're a defensive guy. I don't care. Yeah, I just want somebody to cut him. Yeah, Coach, the um, last game, they, in addition to the yards, part of it was four guys had over 25 yak yards. Uh, how do you, you all try to cut that down? Tackle them. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to say? If, if the guy's got the ball, we need to tackle him. That's the answer. Yeah, that's good. You know? That's why they had yards. We missed the tackle. It wasn't like they were wide open and had a bunch of yards. Other than the one that we fell down on, we missed the tackles. Yeah, that's what With what happened in that game, can you talk about kind of the – the man management that kind of goes into how you're communicating with these guys in the secondary who are, in some instances, thrown into a, a scenario where, um, you know, maybe they were preparing for it, but obviously when things are going bad, you kind of have to build them up at any point during this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, you know, all of us, if, if you're having a bad day, you don't need somebody else to tell you you're having a bad day. You know, the worst thing you can do is go over there and start to berate somebody and and this and that, you just, you got to explain to them. It's like, coach told me one time, and it just always, it, it is very true. Um, you know, you hear guys, and he used an example of an offensive player, so I'll use that. You know, a guy throws a guy, a receiver, a ball, and he drops it. And then the coach yells at him, hey, catch the ball. No kidding, Cap Captain Obvious. Why did you drop the ball? I took my eyes off us. I had my hands wrong. You got to explain to them, yeah, if you got beat in man coverage, here's why you got beat. Here's why the guy caught the ball. Other than it was just a great throw, a great catch, which sometimes that's the case. And tell the guy that was a great throw, threw it over the outside shoulder. Guy made a great catch on the sidelines, tapped his feet in, great throw, great catch. Tell them that, too. That's the truth. So just tell them, don't just say, hey, you got to cover the guy. No kidding. Why, wh you got beat, you didn't get your hands on him, you didn't get your hands up, you didn't turn around fast enough, your eyes were in the wrong place. There's a reason. So whenever, same thing in zone, okay, I didn't break, well, you didn't have your feet underneath you, you were up too high. There's always going to be a reason. That's what you do as a coach, instead of going over there and yelling at him that, yeah, you don't want your guy to catch the ball. No, we all know that. Like I say, the only thing that really ever upsets me, anything on a player, is if he doesn't know what to do, or number two, he doesn't give effort doing it. Other than that, I've seen five Hall of Famers that I've coached get beat, five of them. And they did something wrong. It wasn't because of lack of effort. So it's the same way. I don't, I'm not going to go over there on the sideline where I'm having a tough day and start berating the guys and yelling and screaming that, you know, hey, it's our job as coaches to try to get them right. And if some days you do and some days you don't. Richie, in theory, might be the only guy from your day one starting secondary this year. What's that? Richie might be the only guy this week from your day one starting secondary to actually be out there on Sunday. How does he, how does he progress in terms of being able to maybe handle calls and handle some of maybe the leadership stuff you might have to do? He's doing the same thing he's always done. It isn't like all of a sudden you get – that's what Richie does. That's what all your players do. That's what you program them to do. It's not all of a sudden like, okay, well, Richie, these three guys are out. Now you've got to be more. No, he's got to be Richie. He's got to be what he's got to be. Hopefully if we've done a good job coaching, he's, he is progressing in that matter. I don't – that's the problem sometimes is what happens is somebody else goes down and somebody else wants to help somebody else do their job. That's when you run into trouble. You know, our motto is, our standard is one of 11. I'm one of 11. If all 11 guys do their job, it's going to work. If I start telling somebody else how to do their job or I worry about that guy, then I'm probably not doing my job right. 
So there's nothing I'm not asking any more from Richie this week than I ask of him in the previous seven. Same guy. He's progressing as a safety. He, I think he's doing real well. He's playing consistent. He fell down. What am I going to say? Hey, stand up. You know, it's just sometimes it's, it's just things happen and then they kind of get you off whack and everybody gets a little bit panicky and nervous and stuff like that. And that's where experience has really got to come in and play. I mean, I've seen Ed Reed fall down. But the difference was Ed Reed probably next play made an interception because he was mature, experienced. The guys, they're going to be fine. I'm not worried about this group. He was, he was talking a little bit on Sunday about making calls and that him and Darren, you know, he makes calls sometimes for Darren. Like, how's he progressed there in terms of maybe reading things as he gets more experience? I, I, I'm lost, Mike. Okay. Uh, I, maybe he was just saying something. I don't know what you're talking about. That's I'm, I'm lost. Then, I'm, then I continue to be lost as well. No. Going back to the Rams game, you got Dean in there for a little bit, I think, in the third mm -hmm. quarter, and then before the Seahawks game, you kind of mentioned, hey, it was, had nothing to, to do with Jalen. It's about getting a guy some experience. Well, you've, you've been able to do that with D and a number of other guys. Does that help you when you reach an injury situation? Oh, absolutely. Like you have now, you found ways to bring these guys to the show, yeah. so it's not like. Good point. Absolutely. I think we brought that up last week a little bit. It, it is. And, and Eric Harris has played in there a little bit off and on at, at times. And, you know, that's why you, you do those things is it, you try to get guys ready so, you know, all of a sudden something does happen, at least they can, they can get in there. It's a little harder sometimes during the course of a game, but when you have a week leading up to it, then at least, you know, you can kind of get them ready even a little more. So, but, yeah, that's a very good point.